evening in the scripture to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, the ushers have extra Bibles. Be glad to let you use one of ours. Hold your hand up real high and uh, they'll get a Bible to you. And turn to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Second Corinthians eleven and verse three. Second Corinthians eleven and three. Before we read and go further, let's uh, join our faith together in prayer. The Bible said, "If we'd agree as touching anything, we'd ask." The Lord would do it for us and give it to us. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we agree together in faith as touching this, the rest of the service, asking you for utterance, precise and exact. Give everybody ears that hear and a heart that receives, eyes that see. Let there come answers to questions. Let there come solutions to problems. Let there come direction for right now. And, Lord, speak to us exactly what Uh, we need to hear. No matter what we've thought, you know what we need. Take us that direction and incline our hearts toward it and show us how to do it. And we purpose not to be hearers only, but to be doers, doers of the word. And we know we'll be blessed when we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Somebody say it in faith. I'll get something good tonight. The word of God. Will strengthen, me. strengthen me. Give me light. Give me light. Enlighten, me. Enlighten me. Heal me. Heal me. Deliver, me. Deliver me. Help me. Help me. The, word of God the Word of God will quicken me. Will quicken me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. How many know the Word of God is alive? It's, it's quick, living, and quickening. And uh, when it's Uh, preached or taught by the anointing in faith and it's heard and received by the anointing, there is a quickening. I said there's a quickening. Church is not supposed to be dead. Hmm? (laughs) What is a quickening? Huh? It's kind of like when you get too close to the receptacle. <laughs> when you try and do a little electric work on your own and don't know what you're doing. <laughs> the life of God quickens. Quickens your spirit. Quickens your soul. Quickens your mind. Quickens your body. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yep. Quickens. Amen. Quickens means to make alive or to make more fully alive, to quicken. So uh, you just got through praying and you released your faith and you said the, Lord, the word of the Lord will minister to you, right. Right? right? That's not just based on me. He can say things to you about what was said that I never said. And he's your teacher. He's my teacher, Right? I'm the one that happens to be speaking tonight, but it could be any number of folks. But he's the one that we're listening for. Right? In 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and the third verse, 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, he said, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He said uh, he, he he was concerned about them that what had happened to Eve could happen to them. That Eve was deceived. Eve was beguiled through the, the serpent, the enemy's subtlety. Subtlety. Now the word subtlety 
means craftiness. It means trickery. And the devil is the father of lying. Did you know that? He is the master liar. All lying that any human beings have ever done originated with him. How many understand God is light? He is truth. It is impossible for God to lie. Lying did not come from God. He never created it. The devil came up with it. That's one of the few things he ever came up with. <laughs> Pretty much, he, he, he's not a creator in the sense of being able to create something good. He can't. But what he, what he does do is pervert and distort things that God has cre- created, even good things. He, he twists them and, and distorts. That's, that's what wicked means, is twisted. But the enemy beguiled her, deceived her, and he did it through trickery. And the same thing he did with her, he's been doing with every other human being that's come on the planet generation after generation after generation. And it's not like he needs to try anything new because it's working on every successive generation. He said, lest you be like her, beguiled, are deceived through the subtlety of the enemy and your minds be removed or corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, when you get light, it's simple. It's simple. You've gotten light before you know it. Other people might have made it hard and difficult, but when you saw it, you went, oh, (laughs) I see that. Light means you can see. And the reason things are complicated is because it's dark and you can't see. What is that? Can't make it out. But when the light's turned up, you go, oh, it's Joe. It's Susie. I see them. It's plain. In the light, things are simple. Now, the Bible said that Eve was beguiled. In Genesis, uh, in fact, you can turn back there if you want to, the third chapter, where this happened. Genesis 3, verse 1, the serpent was what? More subtle. What does subtle mean? Crafty, tricky. One uh, definition is cunning. Cunning, tricky. More than any beast of the field. And he said to the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, I'm confused about it. He said some thing, but me and Adam hadn't been able to figure it out since he said it. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh. They were crystal clear. She was clear until now. Now things begin to fog up right here. When he begins to question it and challenge it. And she said... uh, The woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that tree, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Does she sound confused? No. Remember, he said, I'm concerned lest your minds be corrupted from the what? Simplicity. The light is simple. The truth is simple. So what's the devil trying to do? He's trying to make it complicated, isn't he? And here he goes with his lies, trying to make it complicated, but he does not come in the front door. He's tricky. He's cunning. He's crafty. He said, 
uh, you, you won't surely die. You see, God knows that the very day you eat, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God's. You'll, you'll know good and evil and you won't die. So the implication is he didn't want them to be more like him. He wanted to keep them down and they wouldn't really die. He just told them that to keep them away from it and to keep them out of something which was really going to bring them up to another level. And even though he didn't say it, he called God a liar, didn't he? But he's tricky. I don't know what tone of voice he said it with, but I know this. He's tricky. <laughs> hmm? He's tricky. I'm going to say tricky. He's cunning. He's crafty. And he is a liar. And you, you talk about a good liar. What I mean by good at it. He's the best. <laughs> talk about convincing. He's the best. He's been doing it for millennia. And everybody that ever got proficient at lying took lessons from him. You didn't learn it from the Holy Ghost, right? <laughs> and uh, she saw that the tree was good for food. It's getting complicated. And it's pleasant to the eyes. How can anything be that beautiful? Be wrong. <laughs> huh? And besides that, It'll make you wise. Now how is being wiser wrong? How is being wiser wrong? How can these feelings be wrong? They can. Just because they are. It would have never got complicated if she'd have just stayed with the simple. Don't eat of the tree. You eat the tree, you die. She understood it. Adam understood it. It's not confusing. But she's listening to something she shouldn't be listening to. Isn't she? Thoughts. He said, lest your minds be corrupted. We could also say complicated, confused from the simplicity that is in Christ. The truth is simple. Stay with it. Don't let anybody confuse you. Hmm? See, the enemy, uh, Brother, Brother Hagen, my father in the faith, used to say this, if the devil can keep you in the realm of reasoning, he'll defeat you every time. But if you'll keep him in the realm of faith, you'll defeat him every time. That's a good word, isn't it? Don't get all smart and going to figure this thing out and become a deep thinker. And somebody is questioning God and questioning the scriptures in an unbelieving, challenging way. Don't you get sucked into that? Well, I don't want people to think I'm dumb. You're already yielding because you're concerned about impressing. Well, I don't want them to think I'm simple-minded. You want to be simple-minded. Amen. I lost some folks right there. 
Didn't he say, lest your minds be corrupted, lest you be removed from the what? Simplicity that, uh, in Christ. Do you want to be simple-minded? Jesus is Lord. Yeah, but what about this? What about that? He's Lord. He's coming back. <laughs> He's born of a virgin. Yes, but da 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 He was born of a virgin. <laughs> and he raised from the dead. He was dead. Yes, but da 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 Hold up. He raised from the dead. Don't let anything move you off of it. Well, they found this and they discovered that and they found that and, and they figured this out and they found these writings and they found that. He was raised from the dead. And he's coming back. <laughs> yeah, but this dispensation and that dispensation and, and this century and that century, he is coming back soon. Yeah, but they said da 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 and this and this and that and the other. Help me out. He is coming back soon. Y'all are just simple minded and happy and saved. And oh, come on, get this. And the devil can't deceive us because we won't play his mind games and his reasoning games because right. we're smart enough to know we can't hang with him right. in that arena. Right. He's millennia old. He's practiced on every generation since Adam and Eve. Right? You talk about doing a head number on you you talk about a salesman. You talk about a con man. You talk about an a ungodly intellectual. You, you can't compete with him in the mental area. He will wrap you up and twist you up and have you asking yourself what your name is for it's over with. <laughs> and if you, don't, if you don't think that, you're in trouble. Your pride is already making you susceptible to being deceived. But you can just smile and go, well, I don't know about all that. But I know this. Amen. <laughs> He's coming back yes. <laughs> soon. <Yes. laughs> Y'all are just simple-minded and saved yes. and happy yes. and safe. Yes. The devil can't do anything with us because we won't play his mind games with him. What if Eve had done that? What if the devil said, yeah, but you won't really die. She said, he said, do not eat of the tree because when you eat the tree, you die. Yes, but look how beautiful it is. God said, don't eat of the tree because in the day you eat of the tree, you'll die. No, you won't really die. God said, in the day you eat, you'll die. What if she had just stayed real simple, just, just right on well, the Bible said that the enemy deceived her. She allowed him to. In Genesis 3.13, the NIV, the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. After she ate, after she died spiritually, and her eyes were opened, and she did have some understanding of evil. She realized this is not something I ever should have known or wanted to know. And now she realized he has duped her. He tricked her. But it's too late. Now, our text says he was talking to the saints at Corinth, and he says, I don't want what happened to her to happen to you. Here's the thing. The devil cannot forcibly take your blessing away. He can't. He cannot forcibly 
destroy you, steal from you. Did you hear me? He, or, or kill you. He can't. Now, he is the killer, stealer, destroyer. And he's going about as a roaring lion. Do you remember the rest of the verse? Seeking whom he may devour. He cannot by force steal from you. You know what he has to do? He has to talk you into it. Just like this. Did he force Eve to sin against God and Adam? Did he make them do this? No, he couldn't. That's beyond his scope. That's beyond, no matter what he says, he can't do it. Especially since the cross. The Bible said he's been stripped. He's been brought to naught. And he's under our feet. That's what the Bible said. He cannot make you do something. He cannot forcibly take something away from you. And yet, Christians are being robbed I mean every day. Why? How? What's going on? He is crafty. He's subtle. He's tricky. And he talks people into forfeiting what belongs to them. Giving up and, and, and giving up on what belongs to them. Y'all going to help me with this tonight? Do you believe this? Yes. He's subtle. The, uh, go, you're, you're there in Genesis. Go to Genesis 27 and you'll see a picture of subtlety. In fact, I saw something today that I, I hadn't really noticed in this way before. In Genesis 27, Jacob tricked his brother Esau. Do you remember that? When it came to the birthright and the blessing. The word subtle literally means, one of the uh, root words literally means smooth or slick. <laughs> Some must say smooth. And it's interesting that there's a picture of smooth in this passage. Genesis 27, 35, after Jacob had uh, tricked his brother and his dad and, and, and Esau found out about it, he told Esau, he said, your brother came, this is Genesis 27, 35. What does it say? Your brother came what? With subtlety. And what did he do? He took away, he has taken away your blessing. How did he take away his blessing? He didn't force him to it. Esau was the big hunter, trained in weapons. I mean, uh, no way would Jacob go hand to hand with him. And he still got his blessing. He couldn't whoop him. He couldn't take it away from him forcibly. He couldn't have made his dad do it. And yet he took it through craft. Can you see this is all through the world system? How are people doing stuff? They're taking stuff. How are they doing it? Lying, stealing, cheating, crafty. Got to watch that fine print. <laughs> huh? Uh, that's the devil. That's him. That's who he is. And uh, he said, Your brother came with subtlety and he's taken away your blessing. And he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? Jacob means supplanter or tricker, deceiver. He has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now he's taken away my blessing. 
And how did he do it? Trickery. But now listen to this. The word for subtle literally means, the root word means smooth. And here in the 11th verse of the same chapter, this is how it, this was involved in him tricking him. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. <laughs> but he put skins of the kids of goats on his hands and upon the what? Smooth. That's verse 16. You didn't know where I was, did you? Verse 16, he put skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. He covered up his smooth. Huh? With a fake, with a phony hairy arm. And he got that blessing. His mom was involved with this. Where did she get this from? Where did he get this from? From the devil. The Lord turned some things around with it. But how I many know the Lord's not a partner to a lie? No. Or deceiving anybody. Never has been, never will be. But smooth, slick, crafty. Cunning. That's how the enemy defeats Christians. That's it. He didn't make Adam and Eve sin against God. He talked them into it. Didn't he? He talked them into it. He's not robbing Christians and forcibly taking away their peace, their prosperity. Their healing, their deliverance, their long life. You know what he's doing? He's talking them out of it. And they don't even know it's him. Because he's not going to show up at your door in a red suit with a pitchfork. His whole plan is to stay in the dark. He, he much prefers you don't even believe there is a devil. But when thoughts come, yea, has God said? It, how could it be that way? And reasoning gets involved. He will try his best, and he's all too often too successful. He, to, to get you to decide it either doesn't belong to you, it never did, it wasn't the will of God. That all passed away with the last apostle. Not for this dispensation. Just for the Jews. Are you listening? Not always his will. We don't understand why. See, people get wise. Eyes get big like an owl. And they go, well... You just never know. And, and, and try to quote some scriptures and, and don't realize this is the subtlety of the devil. And there's times it's coming out of preachers' mouths. Are you listening in the pulpit? Because while it's being heard and thought about, people are losing their faith. They're deciding they can't have it. They're deciding I won't be able to have that. And it's a lie. The devil just stole their healing. He just stole their blessing. He just stole their deliverance. Yep. Yep. And he's a defeated foe. Right. He couldn't take it away from them forcibly. Right. Sure. But he's convinced them to forfeit it. Oh, come on. Can you see this, friends? To forfeit To concede and forfeit. Listen to the definitions of concede. To acknowledge something, to admit it. To acknowledge what? In this case, you're acknowledging the devil is right. Isn't that what Eve did? What'd she do? 
Well, she went ahead and, and ate of the fruit and ignored what God told her, so she's conceding that what the devil has said is, is true, and it was not true. Uh, a definition for concede is to acknowledge a victory before it is officially established. I'm going to say that again. To concede, like in a, a game or an election, to acknowledge an opponent's victory before it is officially established. It's not going to work. It's not working. You're worse than you were. <laughs> you might as well quit. And, and you know, you've missed it in so many ways and come short. So many ways. Maybe, you know, God can do that, of course. Does this sound tricky and slick yeah. and <laughs> smooth and... Of course God, and see, this is going on between people's ears, and sometimes they're not saying a word, but all these thoughts. I had the privilege of working in Brother Hagin's uh, healing school for a number of years, and we'd visit people in the hospital and, and minister to people there, and, and I, I could tell when people got quiet on me, they're in trouble. I'd go to see them, and they're just laying in the bed being quiet. They're just sitting in a chair quiet and they're not happy. What are they doing sitting there quiet? What are they thinking about? Did you hear me? What's, what's going on? See, the Bible said, the, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not natural, but they are mighty. Through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, uh, bringing into captiv captivity every thought. Somebody say every thought. Every. every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is where battles are lost or won. Right, right here. So I so said I thought it was with faith. Yes, but what you think on affects your faith. Right. If you hear and see and think on the Word of God, it's going to feed your spirit. Your faith's going to come up. If you hear and think and feed on dying and failing and going under, you're going to lose your faith. And if you listen to the wrong thing long enough, the devil will talk you into forfeiting what really belongs to you. How many don't want to forfeit what belongs to you? Especially not to that sorry rascal, the devil. <laughs> huh? What good can come out of us conceding to him? None. We'll just be robbed of something that Jesus bought and paid for. You know, if a loved one went to great uh, effort and sacrifice to buy something and, and, and provide it for you, don't you know they want you to enjoy it? And if you didn't enjoy it, what good did it do for, for them to sacrifice? And go through all that effort. Did the Lord buy something for us? Yes. Did he pay for it? That's what redeem means. Yes. Well, if he bought it, he paid for it, it belongs to us. Right. It belongs to us. Right. And the devil cannot take it away. He can't. The only thing he can do is talk us into giving it up. Forfeiting, conceding, just like what he did with her. Read a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that talk about this. Come on over, if you would, to uh, Colossians, the second chapter. What are you supposed to do with the devil? Resist, right? Not yield to. Not give in to. A lot of people have had a lot of problems with rebellion. <laughs> Just stubborn, hard headed. If you say up, they'll say down. If you say right, they'll say left. They just, they'll say it before they they just <laughs> just ornery. <laughs> and here's the thing. 
It's not necessarily that you just need to get rid of all that. You just need to know where to direct it. That's some good news to a lot of people because you, they've been ornery all their life. and they Just don't be ornery with God. Don't resist Him. Don't argue with Him. Don't talk back to Him nor to those He put over you. Did you hear me? But when the devil says something, you can be just as rebellious as you know how to be. Just, just rebel against it. And there's your outlet. For being rebellious, right? Just just rebel. He just says three words and you go, No, 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 you can't make me, I'll never do it. <laughs> and that's resisting the devil. And that's exactly what you need to do. Come on, backtrack to Genesis 3. What if Eve had have done that? Huh? If uh, the devil had said, Yea, has God? And she said, Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> shut up! <laughs> but I didn't finish. I'm trying to say, Shut up! Shut up! I resist you! <laughs> I mean, you can just get full of attitude. Just get <laughs> with the devil. Right. And that because what is that? See, so if you do that with people, you're resisting them. You do that with God, you're resisting God. That gets you in trouble. But you're supposed to do that with the devil. <laughs> I said, you're supposed to resist him. But you've got to recognize what's him. Because like we said, he didn't come to the door in a red suit and a pitchfork. He's tricky. He comes in the back door. The Bible said he transforms himself into an angel of light. He is the preeminent actor. He, he knows how to come in and convince you. His favorite thing is to convince you it's God. But it's him. And that you should be noble and humble and be willing to sacrifice and if God get more glory out of you being sick then you just need to humble yourself I'm listening for some attitudes from somebody huh no 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 why? Because that's not God. God's not asking us to do that. If he was, it'd be a different thing. If he'd have wanted us to be sick, all he'd had to do is nothing. <laughs> but he took our infirmities. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. No way it's his will for us to stay sick and be sick. So don't entertain anything else. Keep it simple. God's will for me, healed, strong, live a long time, run my race, finish my course, be in good shape to do everything I need to do. And anybody try to tell you anything different, you get attitude. You go, ah, no, no, <laughs> resist it. Don't give place to it. Don't entertain it. Don't consider it. Don't ponder it. But you should at least consider it. No, I shouldn't. No. I should stay simple, simple, simple. Somebody said out loud, it's God's will. It's God's will. For me to be healed. For me to be healed. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. And live a long time. And live a long time. It's God's will. It's God's will. Period. Period. That's it. That's it. Well, if it's God's will for everybody, what about sister so-and-so and brother minister so-and-so? He was a good man. He died at 32 with the awful disease. And, and what about so-and-so? And what about so-and-so? 
It's getting complicated. It's getting cloudy in here. Right? Can he, can he keep you from getting your healing? Can he take it away from you? He, can, he doesn't have the power to, so what's he, got, what's he trying to do? He's trying to talk you into accepting reasons why either it's not God's will or I don't qualify. Did you hear me? Or so, some reason why I will agree with him that I'm not going to get it. And I'm not going to have it. And that's the only way he can steal it from you. The only way. Are you listening? That's why there's so much static about teaching on prosperity. If there's one thing the devil hates worse than a godly man, it's a rich godly man. (laughs) Oh. Oh, you know, because the Bible said, that uh, the words of the poor are not heard. Hmm? They're not heard. In this world, it takes money to get the word out, to have a voice, to be able to hear. How many say if we didn't have enough money to have an auditorium, to have the lights on, to have a PA system, to have a service, there'd be no message. Right? right. right? right. Is that true? It's true in every church. It's so, so the devil does not want you to believe that prosperity belongs to you. I said belongs. You have a right to it. It's been taught and believed through churches for centuries that poverty is actually akin to holiness. It's, you know, it just shows it's a, it's a level of humility to to live like this. And, and there's been a lot of good people that's been very, very poor, but them being poor didn't make them good people. They were good people in spite of being poor. You with me now? No. But the devil has been very successful in talking the church out of their prosperity. Very. Oh, you talk about success. That's an area he has just won battle after battle after battle. Christians will fight you over their right to forfeit prosperity. Doesn't make sense. If you want to fight for something, don't fight for your right to be broke. Because after you win, you're going to be the one who can't pay your bills. Broke. Come on. (laughs) Right? But when somebody tries to tell you it's not God's will, come on, what should be happening? Something should come up in you. Remember the attitude? You go, no, no. God's a good God. He's the God of abundance. He supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He gives unto me richly all things to enjoy. It is written, the Lord is my good shepherd. I shall not want. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it, what about brother so-and-so? You don't know about brother so-and-so. Keep it simple. Don't let your minds be removed or corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, the anointed one. Colossians 2, are you there? Colossians 2. And you can go ahead and find Revelation 3 if you want to, and we'll just turn from one to the other. Colossians 2 and Revelation 3. Colossians 2 and 18, he cautions. And he says, verse 18, Let no man, do what? Beguile you of your reward. And he talks about some ways that that could happen. Verse 19, if they can convince you not to hold to the head Jesus and get sidetracked and get off, but to get get this idea, don't let anybody beguile you, trick you out of your reward. Well, why would he say that unless it was possible, unless it was happening, that people are being tricked? You see the same thing, similar thing rather, in Revelation 3 and 11. Revelation 3, 11. The Lord said this. 
He said, Behold, I come quickly and hold that fast which you have. Why? That no man take your crown. How did Jacob get his brother's blessing? Through subtlety. The Bible said he took his blessing. He took it away through his trickiness and craftiness. The Lord's cautioning us, warning us. What you got? Hold fast. What does it mean to hold fast? Somebody help me out. What does it mean hold fast? Hold fast. What does that mean? Hmm? Like a dog with a bone. <laughs> huh? What is, that? what is that dog persuaded of something when he gets a hold of that bone? What? Two main things. This bone is good. And this bone is mine. <laughs> right? If Christians would just be that simple. Just that simple. Healing is good. And healing is mine. Prosperity is good. I know there's millions of people whose minds have been corrupted and, and talked out of their prosperity, but they should listen to the Bible. Instead of all this reasoning and all this wrangling, prosperity is good. Being broke is bad. Being able to pay your bills is good. Being able to feed your kids and have clothes, and send them to school and have all your needs met is a good thing. Being broke is a bad thing. There's no way, no how that being poor, being broke is a blessing in disguise. The Lord doesn't disguise His blessings. He's not a disguiser. He's not a hider. He's not a tricker. We're talking about that ought to give us a clue right there. Was God trying to disguise something? That's just a religious church term. Oops. Did you hear that holy cow moo? As she hit the ground? <laughs> Do you know of any scripture that talks about God disguising blessings? Any, any verse? Then why do you believe that? Why would you say that? See, the Bible said, you have made the word of God of none effect because of your traditions. You've held on to them and believed them. Why? Because that's what your parents believed, and that's what they believed, and that's what's preached in your group and your denomination, and it's been handed down for generations, and now you believe that so much that you don't believe the Word of God when you hear it. You push that aside and go, well, now we always, we believe this. People say, well, I got a right to my belief. You know, it's like you do. No, you don't. No, you don't. We got a right to believe this. This. Jesus is Lord. You don't get to decide, just believe what you want to believe. Right. He's Lord. Yes. You believe what he tells you to believe. Right. And he said, it's the thief that's coming. I'm quoting Jesus, John 10, 10. The thief comes, not except he's coming to steal from you and kill you and destroy you. And he said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly the amplified what does the amplified say that you might enjoy have and enjoy life somebody say will of God will of God this is red letters words of Jesus that you might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows that's what abundance means. They're just defining abundance. Whew. But the devil's slick. He's tricky. Now, if you've walked with the Lord very long, you can look back to situations you were tricked in. Hmm? That you woke up. Hmm? 
I know myself, I know Phyllis, back 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and 10 years ago, situations and things where you went, what? You mean we could have been, and we could have been having this, and we could have been doing this, and you realize I've been had. I'm not talking about somebody else, I'm talking about me. I've been had, I believed lies. I bought into it. And you try to figure out, where did I get that? I thought that was the word. I thought that was what the Bible said. And you begin to realize, that's not the word. That's somebody came up with that. Maybe a relative, maybe a preacher. Check preachers out. Do not just swallow everything that comes out of people's mouth, hook, line, and center. Check it. Somebody say, check it. Check Check it. Is it true? Is it not? Everybody that you'll have ministered to you, they're a human being. They don't know everything. They know in part. They could make a mistake. They could say something wrong. Right? And I know you know you, you love people and you appreciate ministries, but check them. Check them out. Closely, carefully, everything they say. Are you with me, friends? Because the enemy is what? He's tricky. He's crafty. And sometimes he fools preachers. Hmm? And without realizing it, they're fools, so they're trying to fool you. And don't know that they're trying to fool you because they think it's right, but they're fooled. Because the devil's tricky. You can know the spirit of it if it's, if it's taking something away from you. Come on now. Yes. Something you got excited about at one point, but now you're coming to your senses. <laughs> Realizing. You know, we got to live in, in reality. <laughs> we know you've been listening to somebody. Well, you've you, you got to use wisdom, Brother Keith. You ain't talking about wisdom. You're talking about reasoning. People call it wisdom, and that sounds religious and good. Well, you've got to use wisdom, Brother Keith. <laughs> when the end result is we don't get it, that ain't God. Somebody got snookered. Somebody got fooled. Bamboozled. Tricked. Huh? Can you take a little more? Not quite done. When the enemy... Just thoughts to your mind or through people. He does it through people. He, he, he'll do it through people that you love and care about. Hmm? He's counting on you caring so much about them that you'll swallow this junk. He's tricky. I said he's tricky. And sometimes you just need to smile and hold up your hand. And go, no. You know, if you're in the fight of your life, you've been told you've got X amount of time to live. You've been told you're going to lose everything you've got. You cannot afford to let somebody do this around you all day and night. You can't afford it. Are you listening? Well, I don't want to be rude. Well, do you want to die? You just need to tell people, no, no, I don't believe that. And I don't want to talk that. Hmm? Well, yes, but we, we have to deal with real. I said. Hmm? No. I, I, don't want, I don't want to talk that right now. I don't want to look at that. You know, once you know what the problem is, you can discuss it for five more days and it's not going to change. Once you know, that's time to get in faith. Get in faith, 
and not talk the problem, talk the answer. Talk the solution. And anything that tries to talk you out of it, you got to get feisty. Come on, are you with me? I've, I ministered there in healing school, like I said, for, I don't know, what was it, Phil, 15, 20 years. And uh, I saw people who were given up to die, no hope by medical science, last stages of this or that disease, skin and bone, tubes, breathing machines. And I saw some people perish. And I saw some people come all the way from death's door totally healed, back home, back on the job, and that was 20 years ago. They're still alive and going. But every one of them, every one of them that had these kind of miracles, they had something in common with each other. They were fighters. Are y'all with me, friends? Fighters. Somebody say fighters. Fighters. The Bible said, fight the good fight of faith. Didn't it say it? You got to be a fighter. Anything that tells you you're not going to make it, you cannot be polite. <laughs> Come on, are y'all with me now? You cannot go, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, no, you're already yielding, you're already entertaining. You're wavering, vacillating. Man, you got to get on the word and you got to say, I will not die, but I will live and I will declare the work and the glory of God. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to finish my course. Yeah, but you got two weeks to live, says who? <laughs> Nothing can be done for you. Who can't do anything for me? All things are possible with God. Yes. All things are possible to him that believes. I've seen it. I have seen people whose insides were mush, mush from cancer. They opened them up and they just clamped them back. Didn't even sew them up. Just clamped them. Temporary. So, you know, they'll be dead in a few days. 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Alive and well. And, of course, a lot of other people died with that same thing, and they've be, been gone since then. If they're believers, they went to be with the Lord. Hmm? But they forfeited time they could have had down here. They conceded defeat. They lay there, and they got quiet, and they thought about dying. And just like Eve listening to that reasoning there at the tree, yeah, but this, and yeah, but that. And what about this? And yeah, but you know, you don't know much word and you've never been very spiritual and you've made so many mistakes and you've had a good life and, and you've enjoyed things. And no. Come on, help me out. No, no, no. It is written with long life. He'll satisfy me and show me his salvation. It is written. And I'm not satisfied. And I'm not old. And I'm not done. And it's not hard for God. Anything's possible to him that believes. How does the devil steal from Christians? Help me out. How, how does he do it? Subtlety. Craftiness. Cunning. Thoughts. Feelings. Talking to you. And when you hear it, you better not sit there. You better not listen to it. You better not play with it. Hmm? It's time to resist. Huh? Time to resist. We had uh, Brother Dot and Jerry Horton here a while back. And how long ago was it uh, she was attacked with that? Man. 50 something years ago maybe 60 I don't know that she was told she had the worst kind of cancer that there is the most rapid developing and they gave her no hope 
She's alive today. They told her her, her organs were destroyed. She'd never be able to conceive or have a child. But besides that, she'd be dead in just a little, a little while. Uh, I preached with her son for years. <laughs> and her and Doc were here, and she spoke some. Did you remember hearing her? Could you see how she would get up in the devil's face? <laughs> they, told, they told her, go home, you know, and try to be comfortable because there's nothing that can be done, especially years ago. Nothing that can be done. And she refused to do it. Hallelujah. No, she wasn't going to die. Amen. No, she's young. She's got a husband. He needs her help in the ministry. She's got children. They need their mama. Yeah. No. Yeah, but you can't help it. You're terminal. You got a few days. No. No. She's going to live. Somebody say all things are possible. All things are possible to him that believes. But can you see you've got to fight the good fight of faith. You can't play with it. You can't toy with it. You can't entertain it. You got to resist it. Somebody say resist it. Say it again, resist it. Resist, resist the devil. Resist the Tell me what will happen. He will flee. flee from you. In Acts 27, this is one area where the devil steals from people. He steals their full length of days. He steals their healing. He steals their prosperity. He steals their peace. He can't forcibly take it away, but he talks people into it. He's very good at it. He talks people into conceiving. He talks people into giving up and forfeiting. And it's easy to do when you get tired. Everybody awake in here tonight. It's easy to do. But you need to know the devil cannot destroy you if you won't quit. He can't. Oh, he'd like to convince you that he can, but he can't. I said he can't. Somebody say he can't. You need something strong in you that will give you hope and give you a vision to live for and to reach for. Or to believe for your money for. Hmm? If, if all the vision you've got is the biggest flat screen TV they make and the most comfortable recliner that they got, <laughs> and that's all the vision you have for prosperity, then you won't go too far. But if you can be kingdom oriented, if you can have kingdom vision, Something much greater can kick it, kick in when you're under attack. Are y'all with me, friends? The Lord's talking to some people tonight. Don't don't be in a big rush to get out of here. Are, are y'all hooked with me or not? We we need to get this. And she said, "Well, I don't know that I need it right now. It ain't over, huh?" The enemy's always trying to do stuff. So you you want to be prepared ahead of time that no matter what comes up. You don't even begin to let the devil talk you out of your blessing. In Acts 27, notice this. I've used this myself. Ministered to me when I saw it years ago. And I want you to grab a hold of it if you hadn't already seen it. Acts 27. Paul was a prisoner on board this ship. He warned them not to leave port at that time. He, he perceived it, that there would be loss of the ship, uh, of life. But they thought, what does this preacher know about sailing ships? And they ignored him. And, they, and it looked like there was no reason. The weather reports was good. And it was fair. But not long into the trip, they got into one of the worst typhoons, hurricanes, and they threw all the stuff overboard and they just sure they're going to die. And Paul gets in the floor, gets in the hull of that old boat and seeks God. 
And uh, an angel of the Lord came to him. Acts 27, 24. And know what the angel said? Fear not, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Now let's just stop right there. Tell me what that means. What's everybody's mind on, on out here? Dying. Thinking just any moment this old boat's going to crack up and we're all going down, we're all going to drown. Nobody will ever know where we were. We'll sink to the bottom of the sea. What is Paul expecting now? You can't finish the trip and make it to Rome and preach in front of Caesar and drown out here right now. <laughs> oh, somebody got it. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. How, how does the Lord help you through an attack? Not necessarily by calming the storm. It would have been much nicer and more comfortable if the, the sea had just laid down and the wind quit blowing. But this thing is still pitching and it's, wor- you know, it's worse than it's ever been. You know how the Lord gets you through? He gives you a word. Oh, come on, come on. Come on, he gives you a word. And how many know it doesn't matter how hard the wind's blowing, how big the waves are, that word is greater. And that word will bring you through if you'll lay hold of it and receive it. But it takes faith. You're still green around the gills. Everybody's throwing up. They've already thrown over all the the, the tackling and the cargo of the ship and everybody's scared. And you're rocking and you're rolling and seawater's slapping you in the face. He comes out just a little bit later and tells them, be of good cheer. (laughs) Have you read it? He's having to hold on to keep from getting washed off the side because the storm has not subsided. Be of good cheer. Because the Lord sent his angel. There it is right there. And he told me, we're not going to perish. God has given me all that sail with me. Boy, they should have been glad that preacher was on that boat. (laughs) I believe God, it shall be. Even as it was told me. Whew. Listen to the living Bible on this verse 24. He said, don't be afraid. This is the angel of the Lord talking. To, don't be afraid, Paul. You will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God has granted your request and will save the lives of all those sailing with you. Paul had asked for them. And God gave them to him. He could have just saved him. Couldn't he? So take courage, he said. I believe God, it will be just as he said. Glory to God. The brother who was the pioneer in uh, the speaking with tongues and being filled with the Spirit in the at the turn of the century. Ah, his name, Parham, Brother Parham. Yes, uh, a lot of folks don't know, but the people in Azusa Street were influenced by him. And, and, uh, but back when he first started preaching Acts 2-4, his life was routinely threatened. People met him outside the church and beat him up. Hurt, beat him up bad. For preaching Acts 2-4. You know we enjoy great freedoms. Because others have, have blazed the way. And, and we enjoy truths. Because others have stood up and were persecuted. And 
and didn't back down. And so his wife and even others tried to plead with him, and they were concerned that he's going to go out to a meeting and not come back because people keep threatening him, going to kill him if he keeps if he uh, keeps preaching this. He said to them, "Until I have finished my course, I am immortal." They can't kill me because I ain't done. We see that in Jesus, don't we? I mean, they were ready. They had it planned. They're going to crowd in on him. They're going to get him. They're going to put hands on him and arrest him right then and take him right then. But the Bible said he knew his hour was not yet come, and he just walked right through their midst. he just go right out the way. They couldn't find him. They couldn't get him. How do you miss somebody that's right there? <laughs> oh, friend, are you hearing the word of the Lord tonight? Now, when I've run my race and I've finished my course, I'm ready to leave. Are y'all with me? I don't, I don't want to hang around here. I mean, compared to heaven, this place is a garbage can. <laughs> but, but, I'm not done. And you're not done. Come on, are you listening, friends? Don't let the devil rob you of years you should have, of health you should have, of resources, prosperity, come on, opportunity, relationships, restorations. Come on, are you listening to me? That belong to you. Jesus bought it. Jesus paid for it. It's not like you're asking for some special favor. It belongs to you. I said it belongs to you. See, people are confused. They go, oh, please, God, you know, they're 40 years old. They go, please, God, if you just give me another three years. Please, God, if you just give me another five years. You don't have to beg for five years. You don't know the Lord. You don't know his will like you need to. He's already bought it. You don't have to talk him into it. It was his idea to buy it for you before you were ever born. Yes. <laughs> but the reason why you know, that people are, are, because they're that way, they're easy to talk out of it because they're not established in the word. And their understanding is lacking. And so all these reasons come up, well, you know, this and that and maybe this and we just don't know and And it's like Eve standing out there. She's buying it. Sometimes people are quiet, but they're buying it. Even even their own spouse doesn't know it. But they're buying into this stuff, and they're they're making plans to forfeit, to concede. Because it's easier to just quit. It's easier to just concede. It's easier. You know, Phyllis and I right now, and I know... The staff and a lot of you have prayed with us and all. We're, we're believing to step out. We're believing to expand. We're believing for bigger things than we've ever seen before. And that's not comfortable to your flesh. It's easier to just say, hallelujah. We got, we got a good church. We got a good group. We got a good home. We live good. Just be happy. <laughs> that's so much easier than going into the unknown, than reaching higher than you've ever reached before. Come on. Why? Because it belongs to us. Come on now. The giants are big and the walls are tall, but the Lord has given it to us. It belongs to us. Come on now. And greater is he that's in us than any of that. That's against us. It takes courage. It takes a fighting spirit. It takes strength of heart and mind that you, no matter what you see, what you feel. I know an uncle of mine uh, years ago had lung cancer. Man, this was nearly 30 years ago. And uh, 
Doctors gave him no hope. It was spread to both lungs. It was advanced. It was in his blood and in his organs. And, you know, they just want to make him comfortable. And he, didn't, he knew very little about God and about healing. And I, Phyllis and I had just found out some things. And they lived a distance away. I sent some materials. We went there a couple of times. And I'm trying to encourage him that God would heal him. Well, it was new to him. And he's suffering. He's in pain. Down to skin and bones. And uh, uh, I kept, you know, kept pumping the word of God into him. Just all I knew. Kept telling him, you know, all things are possible to him that believes. You know, nothing's too hard for the Lord. And, and, and this is not the will of God. And he hadn't heard this before. In his church, he had heard it. It obviously was the will of God. It was happening. Must be the will of God. So he's bed fast. And we went for another trip. And I'm, I'm sure I made some mistakes and didn't say everything right. I didn't know much. But I lit in on him again. <laughs> God will heal you. God will raise you up. He can get you out of this. He can. And, and, and he's, he's listening and he's looking. And I left the bedroom. And I came in. His family's crying. They said the doctor said he's, you know, he should have already been dead. Or he should have been gone. And we heard a noise. We looked around. It was him. And he was leaning up against the, the, the side of his, his door facing. Just emaciated. You know, it took everything he had to, to get there. And he looked at me and he looked at them. He said, I'm going to live. <laughs> now he about fell down when he said it. And they had to rush and get him. They tried to help him back in the bed. And he looked no better. He looked like he'd die the next day. And, and, and his folks just broke out and cried and go, well, it's, it's affecting his mind now, you know. <laughs> and we appreciate you coming and trying to console him. And I wanted to scream, I'm not trying to console him. <laughs> we believe in God. Listen to me. The Lord ministered to me about this this week. And this is another subject, another message. But don't feel sorry for people. Are y'all with me, friends? Most of the Christian church thinks it's Christian and godly to feel sorry for people. Feeling sorry for people is agreeing with the hopelessness of their situation. Feeling sorry for people is being faithless. Are you listening? The Bible said Jesus was moved with compassion. Didn't say he felt sorry for them. The word sorry comes from the word sorrow. It means grieve. You're grieving over them. And the Bible said the sorrow of the world works death. You can be touched with the feelings of people's infirmity, but don't feel sorry for them. Believe they can come out. Come on now. If you really believe they can come out, you're not feeling like it's hopeless, like there's no use, like there's no way. I heard another holy cow move. (laughs) We'll knock that one the rest of the way down. Another time. (laughs) Don't feel sorry for people. Yes, care. Yes, have compassion. But have faith. Have faith. Anyway, they said it's gone, it's affected his mind. They cried while they're thanking me for trying to comfort him. I knew it would do no good to talk to him. I left. He didn't die. (laughs) <laughs> he got better and he got better and he got better and he got out of bed and he started eating and he gained five pounds then he gained ten and twenty and he went back to work and he lived for years somebody say glory to God Tell me what he said. What did he say? What did he say? I'm going to live. I'm going to live. He looked like he was down and out, but he wasn't. There was something on the inside of him. Come on. There was something on the inside of him that began that day to fight the good fight of faith, and he wouldn't quit, and he wouldn't give up, and he wouldn't give in. He wouldn't concede. He wouldn't forfeit. He was convinced. This is good. And this is mine. (laughs) Whoo. 
Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Say it again, glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've told this, this story, but it'll, it'll bear repetition. When I was, I um, guess I was still in my late teens and uh, working in a little place and had just found out that Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law. And there was a sister in the church that was strong, mother of the church, pillar in the church, godly woman. Everybody enjoyed hearing her testify. they just bless you when she'd stand up because you could tell she knew the Lord, and loved the Lord, and had had all kind of prayers answered and things happen. She's diagnosed with terminal cancer. She's in the hospital. Now she's bed fast. Well, the hospital was on my way to work. And I just found out about Galatians 3.13. <laughs> so I'd go by. And uh, I'd say, sister, I'd call her name. I said, can I read to you? Can I read some scriptures to you? Oh, yeah, she loved the scriptures. Well, I'd read scriptures about healing. <laughs> I'd talk about being healed, being healed, being healed. She said, all your scriptures is about being healed. I said, yes. <laughs> she said, now, Keith, you know, uh, I've, I've lived a good life. And the Lord has done so much for me. He's been so good to me, and I'm, just, I'm tired of suffering, and you know, because I'm wanting to pray for her to be healed. She's not hooking up with me. And I just smiled and said, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> so I come back. And I talked about being redeemed, and I talked about by stripes were healed, and, and I talked about anointing with oil, and, and laying on the hands, and everything I knew. And it just wasn't getting through. And one day, I was prompted to read to her Psalm 91, 16. Turn there. We've been quoting it half the night. Psalm 91, 16. What does it say? With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Say it again. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Show him. Thank you, Lord. So I, I read that, and as I called her name, I said, Sister, I said, are you satisfied? Is there anything that you hadn't done? that you'd like to do? I said, you know, we need you down at the church. Us young whippersnappers don't know much. We get so blessed when we hear you talk about the Lord and how good he is and all the things you've experienced with him and you stand up and you, you testify. I said, it just lights up the place. She smiled. She said, I enjoy church. I said, we need you there. Are you sure you're done? She looked at me. She said, well... I knew I had it. <laughs> I, I about jumped out my chair. I thought, that's the first well I've got, you know. She, she said, well, I do love to go to church, and I love to be in the presence of the Lord. And there, the, I, I do want to help you young people. I said, we need you. Tears came up in her eyes. She said, well, I'd sure like to help you. I said, well, you can it says right here in the Bible. Now, she wasn't charismatic and she wasn't Pentecostal, but you show her in the Bible. Come on now. She said, it sure does. I said, oh man, I, I'm just pumped. I'm about, I, I said, it's right there, right there. It says with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. That means if you're not satisfied, if there's some things in you that you, you still want to do and you still know you can do and should do, you have the Word of God. He said He would satisfy you. She said, it does say that now, don't it? I said, it does. <laughs> She's bad fast. I came back the next day. She's waiting on me. <laughs> Sitting up in the bed. Hey! Can you see this? Now, now, you know, it doesn't look like everything's 
changed yet, but how many know, when did we get to victory? When did we get to victory? He said, I, I don't want your minds to be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. When the light comes, it gives you joy. It picks you up. It gives you hope. You think, well, I can come out of this. I can make it through this. Anything it tries to tell you you can't, that's the devil. That's the reasoning. Right? It's too hard. It's impossible. Can't do it. No, all things are possible. Man, I, I had some other scriptures. <laughs> One of them I, I'll read you right here. What is it? Uh, Exodus 23. 25 and 26. Exodus 23. 25 and 26. It says, And you shall serve the Lord your God. He'll bless your bread and your water. I'll take sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. Hallelujah. That angel told Paul, you must speak before Caesar. <laughs> he doesn't have to tell him he's not going to die. <laughs> he knows I'm not dying out here. Because I have an appointment in Rome to preach. It doesn't make any difference if this is the worst hurricane in history. Or if this is the worst boat that anybody ever tried to cross the ocean in. I can't die. Because I'm not done. It doesn't make any difference if the most brilliant minds says it's incurable, says it's terminal, says there's no way, says there's no how. I can't die because I'm not done. The number of your days. He said, I'll fulfill. Genesis said the days of man shall be, you know, the maximum approximate length is 120 years. So you're not done. Hmm? Till you're aged and satisfied. Job said you'll come to your grave in a full age, like a shock of corn. In its season. You don't pull the corn when it's green. No. Not for that type of thing. When it's not developed in the ear, you, you got to wait till the season. And, and when's the season? When you're old, biblically old. Oh, yeah. when even the old people call you old. Oh. <laughs> oh, full of days. Satisfied. Somebody say satisfied. You've seen it all. You've done it all. You run your race. You've finished your course. You've done everything the Lord's put on your heart. Now you can go. Now you can go. Now there's a lot of people that haven't done that. But, like Eve, there's a lot of people that listen to the wrong thing too. Right? Even good people that love God. Good people. But you don't need to look at them or think about them or anybody or anything else. You need to make up your mind, does it belong to you or not? Is it yours? Can the devil take it away from you? Can he force it away from you? He doesn't have the power. He can't do it. Well, then can he talk you into forfeiting? Can he talk you into conceding? Are you going to let him? Are you going to get sassy? Are you going to get attitude? Huh? <laughs> Put that back up there again. Psalm 91 16. I'm about done. Just hold on. Psalm 91 16. What did he say? With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The New Century version. Listen to this one. The NCV. New Century. He said, I will give them a long, full life and they will see how I can save. Now, what psalm is this? I mean, this is universally referred to as the protection psalm. A thousand may fall at this side, ten thousand. 
you know, the destruction, the, the plague, the famine won't come near me, won't touch me. See, people have taken this out apart from the verse, but it is the culmination of the psalm. If you're going to live a long, full life and be satisfied, then you're not going to die with the physical attacks that came when you were 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. Come on, are you listening to me? And it keeps going. You're not going to die from the car wrecks or the plane crashes or the plague. Come on, are you listening? Or from robbers or armed war or whatever the case is. What Psalm 91, 16 is the culmination. The Lord showed you your whole life long how he could save you, how he could heal you, how he could protect you so that you live in spite of all the attacks and junk. You made it through. You overcame every attack and you lived a long, full life until you were satisfied. And at the end of it, you said, Lord, you showed me how you could save me and get me all the way. Somebody say praise God. Say glory to God. Stand on your feet, everybody. Lift up your hands. Begin to praise the Lord and thank Him because you know it belongs to you. Oh, He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age, the end of the world. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. There are two verses I should have given you. Put them up on the screen. Uh, 1 Chronicles 28.20. I should have given you these. 1 Chronicles 28.20. I'm not just reading these to, to fill up time. Take these words. What will get you through the worst hurricane. What will get you, the, not just the storm stopping, what do you need? Word. You need a word that your soul can lay hold on to. That's an anchor to your soul in the storm. Here's a word. Here's a word. Verse 20. He said, uh, be strong of good courage. Do it. Fear not. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. He will sustain me till I've done everything that I need to do and ought to do. Genesis twenty-eight fifteen. Genesis 28, 15, he said, I am with you. I will keep you in all places where you go and will bring you again to this land for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. The New Living says, I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. Glory to God. Do you believe this is the word of the Lord yes. to you? Yes. Did he tell you, I won't leave you. Right. I'll be with you until I have finished giving you everything I promised you. Yes. So when the devil starts bringing all these thoughts and reasonings and feelings, well, you've had a good life. Well, you've done pretty good. Well, you've got some things. Well, well he's trying to talk you out of it. He's trying to get you to forfeit. He can't win by force. All he can do is get you to forfeit, get you to concede. And tell me, come on, help me out, help me out. You've been here for hours now. What, what's your response? What's your response? No! No, no, no! Healing belongs to me. I can get healed and then die if I want to. But I don't have to die with one of the devil's stinking diseases or one of his goofy accidents or something like that, right? Because with long life, he has satisfied me and showed me his salvation. 
Oh, come on, do you see? I know some people got symptoms. Some people's got issues. Some people's had bad reports. But can you see Paul in the bowels of that old boat, rocking back and forth? And can you see when he gets his word, the smile that comes across his face? Everybody's scared out of their wits. It looks like ain't no way out of this. But Paul knows, I ain't dying here. Can't die here. Like Brother Parham said, they can't kill me. I ain't done. <laughs> Jesus believed it. Yeah. You're his disciple. Yeah. You believe it. Yeah. Say it out loud. Say it with conviction. Say it with the fighting spirit of faith. Say it out loud. I will run my race. I will finish my course. I will do all I'm to do. Finish all I'm to finish. The Lord my God, Lord my God is, well able is well able to sustain me, to sustain me heal, me, heal bring me, bring me through everything with long life. With long life he, will satisfy me he will satisfy me and show me, and show me how he can save. How he can save. Hey, hey. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. All the way. Hallelujah.